we're going to continue our series this week. Things that Jesus said that we find in the Scripture. And today, it's a good one. I think everybody's going to like it. I'm going to do my best, put it that way, to give a good sermon. But regardless of whether my sermon's good or not, the words that we're going to talk about that Jesus said are really good. Today, some of our favorites are going to be looking at the book of John chapter 3 today. And what did he say? He said, be born again. I think that's the uh, main message from John chapter 3. Be born again. Now think about this for a second. Imagine with me, if you would, the excitement, the excitement of Jesus' ministry. Of the things that were going on at about the time of John chapter 3. There have been stories, there have been reports about a preacher from Galilee that was doing awesome things, miraculous things. He had changed water into wine. Now listen, we think that was a pretty big wedding. News had spread, I'm sure, that this man that had come to Jerusalem, to the temple for the Passover, had turned water into wine. And that he was preaching and teaching with authority. I think more than anything, that was some, what was really, really touching some people and some of the leaders. That he was speaking with such authority. Word had come about some of the healings that he had done. And even after he arrived in Jerusalem, he cleansed the temple for the first time, driving out the money changers. And again, the miraculous signs that he had done. Everybody would be talking about it. Remember, this is the beginning of his ministry, but still, the buzz is all about. Everybody's talking about this man named Jesus, this preacher, this teacher, who has come to town. Let's see what he has to say. Let's see what he has to offer. Even the religious leaders are talking about it. And one of them, specifically, was a man named Nicodemus. And of course, today, Jesus speaks directly to Nicodemus. But John 3 also speaks to each and every one of us. John 3, 1 through 2. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus after dark. Just those two first verses there. Verse 1 and the first part of verse 2. Tell us so much about this man, Nicodemus. He's going to go on a visit to see Jesus. But what else do we have? We have, he's a Pharisee. I remember Pharisee uh, was one of the major um, parties of the, the Jews back then. There was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were unique in that they believed in the resurrection and they believed in angels. Okay? Um, Sadducees, not so much. They didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They served God for earthly rewards. And since they didn't believe in resurrection or afterlife, uh, or life after death, that's why we call them Sadducees. They're sad, you see? All right? That's how you kind of remember that. That's not really why they called them that, don't get me wrong. But that's, that's how we remember that. And Pharisees, they, they did believe in those kind of things. And here's Jesus who's talking about eternal life. So he's really catching the interest of these Pharisees. Because that's also what they believe in. What else about Nicodemus? He was a member of the ruling council. But he wasn't just a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee who was also on the ruling council. And generally the ruling council would have been more Sadducees. But there was also a group of Pharisees that was on that. So he's like a top Pharisee. What else do we know about Nicodemus? Well, that first couple verses didn't say that. But we, we consider him a good man. If you want references to that, John 7.50 and John 19.39. Whenever Nicodemus is trying to do the right thing, and there at the end of John is where Nicodemus is the one that's going to take Jesus' body off the cross along with Joseph of Arimathea and place it in the tomb. But the, the verse we just read also says that he wanted to meet him after dark or in secret. Now, think about that. That might seem strange a little bit, but 
Oftentimes, people come in to the church office to talk to the preacher, and they don't necessarily want everybody to know about it. They don't want everybody to know some of the questions they may have about different aspects of their faith or different things going on in their life. Nicodemus is in a situation like that right now. Not only that, he didn't. He was afraid of what others might think. They knew that he was seeking out Jesus. So he meets him after dark or in secret. Now, can you imagine? How would you start that conversation? If you just said, I want to meet you. I'm going to meet you after dark, after the lights go out. We can meet in kind of secret. You know, we'll probably not meet where everybody can see us. Don't want necessarily everybody and their brother to know about the fact that I'm going to meet you. How do you start that conversation when you get there? What do you say to Jesus when you arrive that night? Because you've probably come with a lot of different questions. But here's what Nicodemus does say. The second part of verse 2. Nicodemus said, Rabbi, or, or teacher, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. We all know, he said. We all know. Talking about the religious leaders, talking about the people that had witnessed the things that he had done, talking about the people that had heard about it. We all know. He didn't say we all think. He didn't say we've got our doubts. He said we all know. What else did he say? He said we all know God has sent you. We all know that you're here to teach us. We all know about the miracles you have done. And we all know that not only has God sent you, but He's still with you. God is with you. All of us know this. What do I got to say about that? Wow. That's just flat out putting it on the table, isn't it? He doesn't come at Jesus and say, I'm going to try to trick you with some of the comments, like some, uh, some of the questions that some of my, uh, my compatriots will ask. Uh, later on, I'm not, I'm not here to try to get something against you. I'm here to say, wow, look at the things you've done. But he still doesn't get to the point. And he's not there just to say, hey, Jesus, we've seen all the things you've done. Just want to let you know we all know. He's there specifically to ask a question. But he still doesn't get to the point. But you know what? That's kind of how we are in our lives sometimes, isn't it? We have a hard time getting to the point of what we need in our life. But the good thing about it is, when we have a question, we can't ask it, Jesus does. When we can't get to the point in our lives, Jesus does. When we can't cross that threshold into knowing that what we got to do the right thing, Jesus will do that for us. He will push us right through. Wow, the things He has done. And this is the question right now. What question do you have? See, Nicodemus... He's come to ask that question, but he just can't quite spit it out. Can't quite spit it out. Now think about this. All of us have some things that we would probably like Jesus to clarify a little bit. Whether it's about Scripture or, uh, or like Nicodemus. What could he possibly ask? Well, he's a Pharisee, so maybe about the resurrection, maybe about angels, maybe about doctrine, maybe about the Word of God. There's a number of things here that Nicodemus could possibly thinking about asking, but he doesn't get to the point Jesus does. What we know for sure, in a nutshell, in summary, Nicodemus is there because he is searching for God. He wants to know more. He wants to make sure he's on that right path. He wants to make sure he's doing what he's supposed to do. Are you searching for God? Are you searching for God? Now let's put ourselves in his shoes for a second. If you have sought out Jesus, and now you have got an audience with him, a private audience even, so no one's going to hear the question that you might ask. See, the question I might ask Jesus, if he was standing right here beside me, in front of all you, might be different than the question that I would ask Jesus if he was in my office by ourselves in private. That's where Nicodemus is at. Imagine that for yourself for a second. What would you ask? What question would you ask the Lord? Just think about it. Here's some pretty common answers to this question. The 
creation. I want to know about the beginning. I want to know exactly how it all went down. Describe for me in detail about the beginning. Would you ask about creation? That might not be a bad thing. Or, or what about the flood? How did you get all those animals on that ark exactly? Lord, I know you know because I know you are God. God the Son. Explain this to me. I want to know about the flood. Would you ask about the flood? Or would you ask about the end times? Heaven. I think most of us might lean towards this one a little bit. I want to know more about how it's going to be. But the thing is with Jesus, the good thing is, He knows your questions before you even ask Him. Matthew 6, 8. Your Father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask. Even before you ask. Hmm. So, if your question was about the creation, if your question was about the flood, even to a certain extent, if your question was about heaven, hasn't He already answered those? I know that you can find out about the story of the creation and the story of the flood in the book of Genesis. Do you trust Him? Do you believe Him? Be in the Word. You want to know the answers? Sometimes the answers are right there from your questions. Be in the Word. Sometimes He's already answered them in the Bible. You want to know the answers? Listen. Listen. Sometimes, sometimes we're, it's easy to say, hey, listen. Right now, are you listening to me? Or are you kind of zoning off a little bit? Or are you thinking about lunch? Or are you thinking about what you're going to do uh, later tonight? Or are you thinking about something that happened yesterday? Listen to what I'm saying to you. <coughs> Just like when we, when we talk about the guidance that we need from Christ, listen. Listen. I, I use the example of Elijah a lot. Elijah didn't hear God in that big old storm. He didn't hear God in that earthquake or that fire uh, or even the wind. He heard God in a whisper. That still small whisper. That's that Holy Spirit working on you, folks. Do you hear him? Listen. Because sometimes the answers to our questions are already there, right in front of us. Like Nicodemus, many of us have questions about life after death. Because specifically, that's what Nicodemus was there to ask him about that day. Talk about the resurrection. And what does Christ do for Nicodemus and for us through the scripture? He answers. So let's talk about the answer a little bit. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. That's a statement we're all familiar with, I think. I tell you the truth, unless you are born again. But what if you've never heard that? What if you've never heard you must be born again? That'd be confusing, wouldn't it? I think. A little bit. And old Nicodemus had never heard that before. He's not where we are on this side of the resurrection. He doesn't understand. In, in summary, what's Nicodemus going to say? I don't get it. Have you ever had that happen before? Someone's telling you something and you just have to fly out and say, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand what you are talking about right now. You're going to have to be more elaborate and explain it in a different way. John chapter 3, verse 4, Nicodemus says, What do you mean? And I've noticed, when I was studying up for this this week, I, I got a kick out of this. He's not just, what do you mean, asked Nicodemus, exclaimed Nicodemus. It's like, what do you mean? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? How? I don't get it. Explanation point, question mark. What do you mean? And again, Christ is going to be a little more elaborate. Verse 5 through 7, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. Think back, think back a few weeks ago when we first started this series. 
What did Jesus say? I must. Jesus was telling, uh, talking to his mother and father, and we looked at the, a number of times where throughout Scripture Jesus used the words, I must. But today, he doesn't say, I must. Today, he says, you must. You must be born again. Not just any birth, and not just a, a, a literal birth from your mother, but born of water and of spirit. Born of water and of spirit. Maybe Nicodemus starts to understand a little bit more now. But maybe not completely. Let's look a little deeper about what this means to be born of the water and of spirit. Water. Watery grave. We call our baptistry. Why? Because it's what Christ commanded us to do and it represents burial. Water is the burial of your old self. Put away your sins. Repent. Be truly sorry for the sins you have committed. Leave it all behind you. Romans 6, 3-4. Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined Him in His death? For we died and were buried by Christ, with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father... Now we also may live new lives. We come out of that water burial. We come out of that baptistry. Brand new. Forgiven. And also with a gift. We've received the Holy Spirit. Again, that extra bit, that extra bit of conscience. That's, that's the extra bit of, of, of the Spirit pushing us to do the righteous thing, the right thing. We receive that gift that will be with us forever. Acts 2.38 talks about that. One of our favorite verses. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And be baptized. All right? Again, you must. You must. Not you ought to. Or not maybe you should. You must. This is what works, ladies and gentlemen. This is what Christ tells us to do. This is what the Bible tells us to do. We must repent. We must be born again. We must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty plain and simple to me. That's pretty plain and simple to me. If you're putting off baptism, I encourage you strongly, do not. Do not. This is something we must do. And that's the message that Christ has given us through these verses, through what He has said today. This message, in a nutshell again, faith equals trusting God. Do you trust God enough to follow His plan for salvation? Do you trust Him? Do you believe in Him enough to do what He's asked us to do? Because with believing comes some action. We'll talk about that in a second. John chapter 3, verse 8. The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell it where it comes from or where it be going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. That wind is something that's strange, isn't it? You can feel it. You know it's there. But you can't really see it. You can't see the wind. Now, last night, uh, we had some storms roll through, and I guess the night before, of course, I was, uh, I was blessed this weekend to be over uh, west of St. Louis to do my cousin Thomas's wedding, and it was an honor for me to be over there but, uh, and do that for him, but yesterday we had to drive back, and get back to about 11 o'clock last night, and between St. Louis and Evansville, we were in storms. I know you experienced them here too. I think it took us about an hour to get through. Couldn't hardly see in front of us. I was on the expressway, so I didn't want to pull over because you know other cars are coming through. It's dangerous. But boy, I couldn't see that wind, but I could sure see what it was doing. I could see leaves and branches blowing across. And, and I got home and we went to bed and woke up this morning. And again, I saw that the wind had done something in the backyard of the parsonage. We've got a tree that's half down back there. I'm not sure if anybody saw it or not. I didn't even see it until I walked to church this morning. I can see what the wind did. 
I didn't see it happen. I didn't see it happen. But I saw that it had done something. We could see the wind work on things. Maybe it's just that, that the tree kind of half bent over. Just like the spirit in our lives. We can see it work. We can't see that Holy Spirit. We can see what it does to people. We don't understand the wind. Uh, probably some meteorologist does or thinks they do. I can say I don't understand the wind at all. I know it just kind of comes and, and blows things down and messes up our hair and just like the Spirit, right? We don't completely understand what the Spirit is going to do in our own lives. But we do see it and we do feel the effects of it. Right? We see and feel the effects of it. We can't see it. We can see its effects. John chapter 3, verse 11. I tell you the truth. We tell you what we know and have seen. And yet, you won't believe our testimony. Think about this for a second. Jesus does not, cannot, and will not lie. We always say that God's capable of anything. However, that's really not an accurate statement. God cannot do evil. God cannot lie. Jesus is God's Son. God the Son cannot lie. But yet He still has to tell us these statements. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Now think about that for a second. That goes without saying, doesn't it? Have you ever had a conversation with somebody where you're like, look man, I'm not joking at all. This is for real. For real what I'm telling you, you won't believe it. But for real, you want them to know, hey, I'm telling you the truth. But now here's our Lord. Here's God the Son. Here's Jesus Christ the Messiah saying, I tell you the truth. If the Lord says that, you better listen to what He's got to say after it. We're witnessing to you. We're giving you our testimony. There's nothing more powerful than the testimony of Jesus. And by saying, I tell you the truth, He is trying to help us believe. John 3, 16-18. We know this one, don't we? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned. You must, you must be born again. This verse, though, we love it. It tells us a few things. The key to salvation, believing. The most important thing you can do for Jesus is believe in Him. Believe in your heart. Right? That God rose His Son from the dead. That Jesus is the Son of God. But, this verse also tells us that believing requires action. Believing is not just a state of mind to say, yes, I believe. You have to follow up on it. You have to live it. You have to live that lifestyle of Christianity like we've talked about before. And in this case, this action requires we must be born again. We must repent. We must be baptized. Will you take action on your faith? Because when we do, when we take action... We are being the church. Just be it. Just be the church. You see, our first, our first step, our first action in believing, of course, is repent and be baptized. But there's more actions that follow. It's not just take this action and then do whatever you want. We, like we've talked about before, we have to maintain our faith. We have to maintain our Christianity. Folks, there's work to be done in our community. There's no reason why every single week each and every one of us as individuals don't find somebody new to ask to church. Will we always be successful? No. But how important is it that all of our friends and all of our neighbors know what about our Lord? That He offers us salvation. Just believe and take action 
Are you inviting people? Are you expressing your witness to people? Are you taking the opportunity to live an example, an example, to live by example to people of what it means to have Christ's love in your heart? Just be it. So in conclusion today, the verdict of today's scripture, John 19, 3, 19 through 21. This is the verdict. God's light came into the world, so that people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. And all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. The second part, but those who do what is right come to the light, so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Are you doing what God wants in your individual lives? Are we doing what God wants as a church? Are we living in the light? Do we know the difference even? Jesus is the light. Sin is the dark. Some of the things that fall under the light. Good. As opposed to, of course, evil. Forgiving. Not casting stones. Not holding sin over other people's heads, especially when we have a plank on our own eye. As opposed to being judgmental. Righteousness. As opposed to being despicable. Love. Versus hate. Living that Christian example out in the light for everybody to see. Or doing things in the cover of darkness, hidden. Remember, this is still being talked to Nicodemus who came to the Lord at night. And now the Lord uses this example of light and dark. Are we in the light? Are we being good, forgiving, righteous, loving Christian examples? Or is evil, is a judgmental nature, is hate, living in darkness? Is that taking over? I say to you, let our light shine bright for all to see. Like the scripture tells us, we need to be that beacon. We need to be that light that shines out to our community. We need to be that light that shines out to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be the church. We need to be Christians. Will you join with me on this? We have got work to do. We're like flashlights. Now think about this. What's going to win between the light and the dark? If you go into a dark room and you have a flashlight in your hand and you turn on that flashlight, you can see... You can see. And if you let your eyes adjust for a minute, if you're in a completely dark room, you can see more than just that spot. It kind of illuminates the whole room to a certain extent. That's what, that's what light does. That's what living a, a, a righteous life does. It kind of brightens up everything. Are you brightening up everything with people you know and love? Now, reverse that. If you go into a dark room, or a, a light room, a room well lit, and you have a dark light or a flash dark, now, there is no such thing because it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I cannot turn on a dark light and make darkness go over there towards them. I can't turn on a dark light and make darkness go over there towards you all. Why? Because there's lights all around. So what do you want to be? You see the analogy here? It's not literal light talking about righteousness, talking about goodness, talking about love. And every single time, whether it's these literal lights or the lights that we portray through our Christianity, the light will defeat the dark. I say let's be on the winning side. I say let's be on the winning team. So let me ask you, in closing today, I have a few more questions. Will you follow the light? Will you live in the light? Will you be a part of the light that is Jesus? Will you believe and take action? And the last statement, just a reminder, you must be born again. Let's pray.
Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had to once again come into your presence and to worship you. Lord, I ask that you would help us to all follow that path of righteousness, to live in the light, to, to let our Christian example shine before men so that they can see what it means to have your love in our hearts. Lord, we are so very blessed. Please continue to use us to grow your kingdom. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.